When I told her I was a pastor, she said, okay. <laughs> but you can't continue like this. With your stomach hurting all the time and being in pain. If you cannot manage it, you need to leave ministry to heal from it. I brought my body to the doctor expecting her to heal me, but her prescription wasn't medicine. Her prescription was rest. My healing looked like resting from ministry for two years at 30 years old with two children under the age of five. The healing I had to do was far deeper, though, than my stomach pains. And so with God's help, I had to heal the unhealthy lessons my family had taught me about work. If things aren't working, work harder. Outperform everyone. And if that doesn't work, then do not rest until you achieve what you want to achieve. During my two years of healing rest with God, I had to learn how to bring everything my hopes and my dreams and my failures and my worries and my whole self to God and leave it at God's feet. It's in God's time and in God's way that divine healing comes. Today's scripture is a little weird because it's sandwiched in between two other stories. The first story in Acts 5, it shows trouble in the church with Ananias and and these two were stealing money from the church offering, and so the church dealt swiftly yet lovingly with them and held them to account for their actions. And then outside the church, beginning in verse 17 of chapter 5, we see believers of the early church persecuted by the high priest and his people. So what did God's people do with trouble in the church and trouble outside the church? They remain focused on the risen Christ and the Spirit of God at work within them and among them. The apostles, God's sent ones, they performed signs and wonders among the people in Solomon's colonnade. When Michelle read the scripture this morning, it read Solomon's portico. And this area was an important part of Herod's temple. The colonnade wasn't a neutral or safe zone but it was one filled with political and social unrest, a really dangerous place to be. So when the believers of Christ met there and worshipped there and performed signs and wonders and miracles in Jesus' name there, it also signaled to the high priest and the other leaders that none of you can do what God is doing or has already done. None of you are really in control. God is. The believers' acts of worship, their meeting together, their professing the name of Jesus, and healing others in Jesus' name. It scared other people because the scriptures tell us that no one dared come near them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. And yet, even though people were afraid, because of the power of the Spirit of God at work in them and among them, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to Christ's church. More and more people brought their sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats to be healed by Peter and the other apostles. Crowds gathered from other towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by unclean spirits. And because of this, Everyone was healed. Did you catch that church? It wasn't the great music or the fancy ministry programs or the great preaching, thank God, that brought people to be healed. It was the Spirit of God unbelievers saw working in the healing done by the believers of Christ that made them bring their sick to be healed too. Often we don't think we need to bring anything to God to be healed. We live in a world that encourages us to hide our wounds and our scars, to look perfect, to 
be put together all the time. Our world encourages us to step down any kind of grief or loss, or as someone else may put it, to suck it up and just keep living. As believers in Jesus, we often think that once we come to Jesus and once we enter into life in Christ's church, all our problems and all our issues, all our baggage magically disappears. Wouldn't that be a wonderful evangelism statement to tell someone who doesn't know Jesus? <clears throat> Come into Jesus' house and all your problems will magically disappear. We come to believe that all our struggles and unhealthy family patterns and behaviors go away because we're members in Christ's church. But church, the question today is, is the healing power of the risen God at work within us? Is the healing power of the risen God at work within us? My family and I recently welcomed another dog into our house and along with it some more chaos. <laughs> and he's a shelter dog he was rescued from a life of abuse and neglect. And when the staff at the shelter found him, he had mange, which for some of you who may not know is a parasitic skin disease caused by mice that infects a dog's coat. And our dog, we named him Vicky Smalls, he was also malnourished. So once the shelter rescued him, they began doing the hard work of healing his coat and feeding him. But Vicky still wasn't well inside. We took him to his first veterinarian appointment a couple days ago, and the doctor told us that Vicky has some digestive issues due to the abuse and neglect that he suffered with his previous owner, and it still needs healing. <laughs> so, my husband and I paid for the big bag of medications that we needed, and we took him home to make him well, and to give him the medication so that he could be made well. Church, we've already been made well through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Jesus paid for our sin to make our souls well. And it's by Christ's stripes that we are healed and made right with God. Peter and the other apostles had the same healing power of God's spirit to heal others in Jesus' name. And although we may not realize it every day, because we're the people of God and because we've been baptized into Christ's church and by his grace we've been saved and made whole, we have that same healing power. The scriptures tell us the power of the living God was so strong that people brought uh, their, their, their folks to Peter and they brought the mats and they brought all the things into the marketplace. And they laid them in Peter's shadow to be healed, and they were healed. <clears throat> Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But friends, that's God's grace at work. If we want to be healed and made whole in Jesus' name, we'll have to do some crazy things too, by the world standards, to receive that same divine healing. If we want to be healed and made whole in Jesus' name, we'll have to do some crazy things like bringing our whole selves to the feet of Jesus and remaining there. Or surrendering our issues and our baggage and our difficult situations at the feet of Jesus. Or asking another brother or sister to pray with us and for us. Or forgiving someone who has wronged us or harmed us. Or going to therapy to gain tools to learn unhealthy ways of thinking and being that harm us and harm others. Church healing may not look like what we think it should look like. Divine healing often looks messy and chaotic and crazy. It looks like crowds of people bringing themselves and others and their beds and their mats into the public square in front of powerful high priests and other leaders to be healed by the God of all power and all might. Divine healing looks like a man in the book of 1 Kings named Naaman, a rich and powerful man who had leprosy, washing in the dirty Jordan River to be healed. 
Divine healing looks like one of my loved ones calling me on Resurrection Sunday one hour before going into another service to tell me that they had checked themselves into a mental health facility so they could live. Divine healing looks like taking your hands off of every problem in your life and every situation in your life and every person in your life who has caused you worry and pain and giving them to Jesus. Allowing the spirit of the living God to heal it in God's time. Donna is a friend of mine who lives in Glen Burnie, Maryland, which is 10 miles outside of Baltimore City. And Donna and I used to work together when I served as assistant pastor at Glen Burnie United Methodist Church. And she retired a few years ago, but every now and then we talk. Donna is a two-time breast cancer survivor. And after her second time with cancer, she sent the Lord calling her to ministry with homebound members and those battling cancer. And so while she continued working at the church as a secretary, she continued to pray to God for clarity around her work with homebound members and those battling cancer. Today, Donna travels with the pastor at Glen Burnie United Methodist Church to homebound members, to pray with them and to talk with them and to love on them and to be Jesus' hands and feet to them. Donna also knits prayer shawls, and the prayer shawl ministry at, group at, uh, at church knows her very well because she knits the shawls, but she also encourages all of them to knit shawls. And they pray over them, and she takes those shawls, as well as knitted hats, to cancer patients at the local hospital at the cancer center in Glen Burnie. My friend Donna wouldn't say she's doing anything special. She would say that she's giving people hope in Jesus' name as they wait for healing, however that comes. Church, as people of God, we've not been healed and we're not healed by Christ so that we can keep it to ourselves. We've been healed by Christ's stripes so that we can bring our whole selves to others in the world and to one another and show them our scars and say, see, this is the place where Christ healed me. Christ can heal you too. Amen. Amen.